I hereby call the Special City Council for December 2nd, 2019, at being 6.30. Could we please stand and salute our American flag? I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please stay standing. Council Cruz, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to take a moment. Uh, the City of Brockton lost four former valued city employees this past week who all passed away. Uh, all I knew all of them. They were all exemplary employees and great people. Uh, Fred Canducci, who was the uh, plumbing inspector for about 15 years, passed away. Former police captain Eric Nordine passed away. Uh, great uh, employee for the city, Jacques Borges, also very active in the Haitian community in the city and a real leader. And Betty Cesarini, um, who worked for the city for years and, in fact, is the mother of uh, police officer Andrew Cesarini, so I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for all four of those, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. <coughs> Our thoughts and prayers to their families. <laughs> Councilors, before we get in, I just want to uh, give some uh, inf information on why we're meeting down here instead of the Council Chamber. I was notified as the City Council President, and, and thank you for Mayor Rodriguez for being here, uh, that our brand new elevator actually had a circuit issue where one of the circuit breakers failed. Um, the city has a fast track in order. Unfortunately, the manufacturer's in California. So um, we hope to get that tomorrow overnighted. Um, and as you know, uh, due to the impending snowstorm, City Hall is closed tomorrow, and also Brockton Public Schools are closed tomorrow as well. So. Um, that is why we're meeting down here tonight, but I do want to thank everybody from the city that worked collaboratively along with the city clerk to, uh, to accommodate this tonight. That being said, we'll go into the, uh, the agenda, please. We have a special meeting. Members of the city council are here by call. A special meeting of the city council in the city of Brockton on uh, Monday, December 2nd, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. in City Hall, 45 School Street, Park to Bass. The hearing determining the percentages of the local tax levy for fiscal 2020 in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 56, to be borne by each class of real property as defined in Section 2A of Chapter 59 and personal property. Written and oral arguments will be taken at this time. All other related matters as well. Respectfully submitted, Council Robert E. Sullivan, President. That is accepted and placed on file. We have the officer's return of notice. That too is accepted and placed on file. We have the order that the City Council hereby determines the percentages of the local tax levy for fiscal 2020 in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 56, to be borne by each class of real property as defined in Section 2A of Chapter 59 and personal property. Time having arrived, I declare the hearing open. If there's anyone here in favor, please come forward and state your name for the clerk. Uh, we'll use this as the podium tonight. Mr. O'Donnell. Good evening. Good evening, counselors. I'd like to make a brief statement concerning the fiscal year 2020 tax rate classification here. Firstly, I'd like to thank the entire staff of, of the assessor's office for their support and assistance throughout the year. The purpose of this hearing is to establish the proportion of the tax levy raised by the residential and commercial classes of property, also known as the factor. This hearing is required under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 56. The assessed values for fiscal year 2020 represent the estimate of market value as of January 1, 2019, utilizing verified sales data from calendar year 2018. Assessments represent 100% of market value as required by Massachusetts general law. The Department of Revenue has certified the real and personal property for the city as well as the new growth value. The assessors are required to fairly assess 27,552 parcels in the city. There are 24,277 residential parcels, 1,737 commercial and industrial parcels, and 1,558 personal property accounts. The total taxable value of all real and personal property in the city for fiscal year 2020 is $8,426,282,008, which is a 7.43% increase from fiscal year 2019 and is the highest taxable value ever for the city of Brockton. 
This year, the city added a total of $1,769,849 in new growth tax dollars in residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property. The median single-family assessed value for FY 2020 has increased 7.24% from $261,200 to $280,100. The median two-family assessed value has increased 2.34% from $331,450 to $339,200. And the median three-family assessed value has increased 5.76% from $383,700 to $405,800. The median commercial assessed value for FY 2020 <coughs> has increased 5% from 240,750 to 252,786,000. And the median industrial value also increased 5% from 254,300 to 267 dollars uh, People often associate rising assessments with rising taxes. However, this is not the case. Rising budgets cause rising taxes. If the budget increases, typically taxes increase. The assessed value represents the market value of all the property. If all assessments went down 25% and the budget increased, taxes would still increase. The purpose of tonight's tax rate classification hearing is to adopt a residential factor. The City Council will decide on how much of the tax levy the owners of residential properties will pay and how much of the tax levy the owners of commercial, industrial, and personal property will pay. This decision is what creates two tax rates or a split rate in the City of Brockton. The split tax rate in the City of Brockton taxes commercial, industrial, and personal property at a higher rate than residential properties. If there was no shift, there would be one rate. And based upon this year's levy, the single rate for the City of Brockton would be $17.69. If the council decided on a single rate, the median single family tax bill would increase $895. The median two family tax bill would increase $849. The median three family tax bill would increase $1,268. The median commercial bill would decrease $3,152. And the median industrial tax bill would decrease $3,535. Last December, the City Council voted to set the fiscal year 2019 shift factor at 1.73. This meant that for fiscal 2019, commercial, industrial, and personal property were representing 17.17% of the total taxable value, paid 29.70% of the total taxes. Brockton continues to have the lowest average single family tax bill of all surrounding towns based upon fiscal year 2019 data. The average single family bill was $4,204, which was a $284 increase over fiscal year 2018. The average tax bill in the city was $1,051, lower than the average bill of the contiguous towns, including Brockton. Thank you. I'll now answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Donnell. Any questions, Mr. O'Donnell, among the council? Any questions? Seeing none, is there anyone else here um, in favor? Anyone here in favor about this matter? If so, please come to the microphone. Third and final time, is anyone here in, Mr. Cooney? When you say in favor, you mean the uh, speak on the, <coughs> on Speak the on this, yeah, it's a public hearing. Good evening, Mr. Cooney. <coughs> Councilors, thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Cooney with the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you recognize me from being here almost every year and around town. I've been in the city for about 21 years in this role. As you got 20 more? Okay. All right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I represent the uh, businesses in not just Brockton, surrounding communities, and I attend actually a lot of these hearings in different communities over the years. Uh, we own the building across the street, uh, both uh, 60 and 70 School Street. Uh, I'm sorry, 50 and 60 School Street, and uh, we pay taxes uh, as a nonprofit. Uh, we still have elected to continue to keep that property uh, in the chamber's name, and we do pay taxes, and we have ever since we purchased the building in uh, 1998. So I, I think, you know, I want to uh, compliment the assessor. Th this is excellent information, and I, again, attend uh, several of these in different communities. It's timely. I think we had it last week. 
Uh, it's comprehensive and it tells a story. The story it tells is that valuation is going up on all the property in the city. That means demand is increasing, uh, which is good. It's not, you have to kind of, kind of drill down on that and figure out why that is. Uh, some of it is Boston is so hot right now, uh, you're seeing some overflow. Uh, second is the city has great uh, resources, I think, in terms of great schools, great location, proximity to Boston, uh, rail. And I'm going to I can give you the whole chamber speech, which would take me hours, but I think you know as, as residents and as representatives how much Brockton has going for it. Um, it used to be not long ago that uh, people would arrive here with relocation companies uh, with the numbers in hand saying, you know, I know you weren't looking at Brockton, you're looking at Taunton, maybe a Fall River or uh, Middleborough, because at that time there was some industrial park uh, space that was available. Brockton, as you know, is built out and doesn't have as much space available. But uh, there might be a building available, and they say, I know we were heading down to Middleborough and you were locating from Boston as a business, but did you see their tax rate? It's pretty good. Have you seen, did you see their water and sewer rate? It's pretty good. And the price of the building is half of what it would cost to construct new or uh, in another location. And you ended up with a number of companies who came to Brockton to uh, access that value and that proximity to their workforce in Boston. And that's been great, except until the last probably seven or eight years where this, this, these numbers tell the whole story, really. Um, Brockton's residential tax burden has stayed pretty low and pretty, uh, especially compared to surrounding towns. I mean, 30, 35% less on average. Uh, while commercial has risen and uh, is quite a bit higher than some of the other gateway cities uh, south of Boston and is certainly higher than uh, nine of the towns in this region that don't have a split tax rate. They have a unified tax. So when you look at a town like Easton and the industrial park, which is in pretty good shape, close proximity to the highway, uh, you can save yourself about $1,000 uh, a month, in some cases, on, on commercial comparisons with uh, the tax burden in Brockton. Uh, you might contend that you don't have water and sewer, but the water and sewer rates have risen here and are a little bit more expensive. So when you look at the whole package, uh, the demand hasn't been as great. So what you've seen here, residential, because uh, uh, rates, uh, rents are so high in Boston, ha have risen here. Again, with the, the positives too, the, of the city schools being good and the proximity to transportation. Um, but the, the, uh, the burden on the business community uh, has risen, but the demand has not. And so the valuations aren't as high, but yet they're paying a larger percentage of the tax burden overall uh, in the city of Rockton. So uh, I'm here just to a, you know, uh, kind of highlight the positives. It's great that the, the average value for commercial property has risen in Rockton this year. It, ha it hasn't on all the years recently. Um, and that residential has gone up. But I'd ask you to hit the brakes on, on the taxes and really take a look at your comp competition in the surrounding uh, communities in terms of commercial. And uh, you can't go much higher. You're at 173. You can only go 175. That's the state law. Uh, if you're at 175, I almost don't need to be here to, add, to recommend something because you can't go any higher. You're going to be forced, especially if residential uh, valuations, if we hit a recession or something and they start coming down, you're going to, you're going to be up against a, a, a corner here uh, where you're not going to be able to raise the taxes any higher on commercial. Um, so I would ask that you, you focus your efforts on using the resources that are in this city uh, to attract more businesses because every time you attract a business, uh, it can, uh, and it does offset the taxation on the residents, and uh, that's a win-win. But the only way you do that is to increase the demand for commercial property in the city. So I'd ask you to keep that in mind at all times, because every decision you make that makes Brockton more attractive to businesses uh, keeps the business here, number one. Number two, it offsets your, your, uh, your, your burden on your residents and it improves the quality of life and the trajectory and the sustainability of the city as a city. Uh, we don't, I think, want to become just a bedroom community of residents. We want to have a robust business community 
And uh, so I, I appreciate the dialogue that we've had, Mr. Chairman, uh, with your election and uh, some of the dialogue you've heard during the debates and whatnot, the questions from the chamber. Uh, many of you I've, I've talked with about this. I just want to, this is a, a really critical time to uh, remind you that it's very important that we all are moving in the right direction, I think. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Cooney. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Anyone? That's good. Anyone else here? Uh, anyone else here in the chamber? Third and final time, if you're in favor, please come forward. I'm going to state your name. Uh, is there going to be uh, another side? Uh, those opposed under a public hearing. Okay. All right. Third and final time, if you're in favor of this, please come forward. Seeing none, that part of the hearing is closed. If you're opposed to this, please come forward to the, uh, to the microphone. Good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for your services, Mayor, and everyone here. Um, God save the mayor, both mayors. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Euclides Gonsalves. I'm from 14 Martin Street, Brockton, Massachusetts. I moved to Florida. I came back um, after living there for seven years, and I went to school over here. Um, I went to Boston University. My dad, he's 74 years old now. Um, he moved back in his house. We were renting it out when we were living in Florida. Um, you know, he bought a house in Florida. He was using that money that he was renting it to pay off the other house he bought. Um, and he had another house that he was renting too. But we moved back. Um, he's living now with us. He's 73. Um, he's like, you know, everyone else in the city. You know, he, he lives off his income. Um, but what I really wanted to, to point out on this document was... Um, it doesn't talk about the age of the people in residential. So I know that there's a, a current uh, stipend for seniors that they receive $50 off of their um, tax. So um, there's a lot of people living on Social Security income, um, their pensions, and uh, the property value has gone up through the course of several years. Um, and there has been a boom um, the housing market is, uh, I think, above or at where it was before the housing crisis. Um, so I, I think there definitely needs to be a, a value, uh, evaluation on um, whether or not the senior citizens are able to keep up with the tax payments, uh, sir. And um, I'd also like to note, I would like to uh, thank you as well, uh, the gentleman from the Chamber of Commerce, for coming up to speak because um, I do believe we do need to attract business to the city, sir, and it is part of um, uh, Brockton's uh, model industry. Um, I believe that if there were uh, tax benefits to businesses that hired from the city, it can also benefit. Um, if someone's young and they do purchase a house, or if they do rent um, and they're hired through a business, um, the business would receive some type of tax benefit. Um, by hiring directly from Brockton, a resident from Brockton, and it stirs the economy. Um, but definitely uh, with the pensions and seniors, I believe that should be evaluated. Uh, but thank you everyone for your service. And um, you know, I, I hope you know, God blesses everyone with the truth. Um, we just you know, hope the truth of the taxes, the numbers, and everything gets out. Um, thank you. Thank you. And just just point of information, yes, there is there is an ordinance on the books here. It's called the Volunteer Work Off Program. It's for seniors and veterans, um, where they can volunteer time at a city establishment, library, schools, whatever. Yes, sir. Uh, and if they qualify, they'll get a price reduction on the real estate tax. So that's just another tool in the toolbox. I don't. I'm not familiar with the fifty dollars uh, that you were talking about. I don't know if that's a circuit breaker. Are you familiar with that at all? I'm not familiar with that. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much. Thank. You. Councilor, you have a question. Thank you. No, I just wanted to mention, sir, sir, I'm sorry, your son, you, you can take this one. This is um, the news for the Council on Aging, and maybe that could help your dad find out some more information. You, you may keep that one. Yeah. That they can help you out with a whole lot of other um, situations that might be advantageous to your father's circumstances. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time, and thanks for being here. Thank you. Anyone else here? Anyone here uh, in opposition? This will be the third and final time because this is a public hearing. If there's anyone here in opposition, seeing none, 
That part of the hearing is closed. Now the matter becomes uh, before the full council. Councilors. Council Cruz, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to give my yearly speech that I give and haven't really done much through my 14 years here, but um, to back up a little bit of what Mr. Cooney was talking about, um, we, first of all, we're dangerously close to the limit of where we can change the tax factor in favor of the homeowner. And being that close has, has always worried me because it doesn't leave us any, if we would have a year with a, with a cataclysmic event for the city financially, we don't have much room to grow that. Uh, but also, more importantly, when we attract businesses, we help the homeowners in, in the long term. I've been trying to get the factor back down towards that 150 for years. I think if we had started years ago, it would have been pain, a little less painful for the homeowner. Uh, and I, I hope when we get to the number tonight that we look at maybe 172 or 171. What the public doesn't understand is those businesses that come and pay these tax bills, when we lose them or don't attract the new growth, that tax levy is still there. That dollar amount still needs to be replaced. And it falls on the homeowner's burden to, to pick up that, that taxable amount. When we attract those businesses and keep businesses from leaving, it, it helps all of us. It helps the quality of life. It helps the property values of the homeowners. And it helps all of us. So I'm hoping, once again, that we uh, can possibly move downward a little bit, one point, maybe two, so that we can attract, uh, we can make that tax rate, that commercial rate, more attractive to help us attract businesses. <coughs> it's not to help businesses. With, I think there's sometimes m m mis misconstrued people out there who think every business is, is making billions of dollars every year. Most of the businesses in the city are, are small businesses, and those that tax burden is a big a big problem for them. So I hope we can move start to move down at least one percent, maybe two this year. So. Thank you. Thank you, Council Cruz. Council Fowler, please. Just a, just a question for Mr. O'Donnell, if I could. Uh, John, I, not to put you on the spot, but just to provide some balance. Where, where would you say the city of Brockton is with respect to granting either tax increment exemptions or tax increment financing? Are we, are we right in the middle of where most communities are? Are we a little better, a little worse? Or is there any way to judge where we are? Because I'm not sure where it would stand. Okay, but but in terms of tax increment exempt, yeah, for for the exemptions, we're, we're the only area. And this, so, yeah, yes, yeah. So we we've at least tried to address the concerns of <coughs> that commercial helps. development. Exactly. Uh, and I guess this is a question for Mr. Claxon because I I do hear each year that if we bring more business in, it's going to help the homeowner. <laughs> Realistically, you would have to have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of businesses to ever reduce below the two and a half levy, the tax burden. Am I, am I right? Because the, the wages, everything we pay for in this city is rising faster than two and a half percent. The wage increases, the, the amounts of money that's spent for leasing uh, goods, or purchase, leasing or purchasing goods and services. So wouldn't that, wouldn't that figure be astronomically high if we were ever going to offer a tax reduction under two and a half? So the issue uh, is more related to the value of commercial property and not necessarily to, to the budget and, and what we spend. To answer that specific question, in the packet um, that uh, that John and his team put together, just as an example, in this year, uh, it, there's a chart that looks like this, and it gives the total value of the residential property a little over six billion dollars, and commercial at 1.6, and so the residential properties currently make up a little over 83% of the total properties. Uh, but in this, in adopting the factor of 1.73, uh, they actually only paid for 71.3% of the tax. So that's really the shift that we're talking about. So what Councillor Cruz is mentioning actually, if 
the value of that 1.67 billion increases significantly by creating more commercial value. The total value, uh, that percentage shifts, and that's where you get the relief on the, the taxpayers because by increasing the value of the commercial <coughs> property, that sector automatically assumes a greater percentage of the burden. Uh, it's tough to say how much would be enough for it to make sort of an incremental difference. Um, there are other spreadsheets within this packet that, that show by shifting that 1% that Council Cruz was talking about how much the, the burden would shift. And the 1% is a real, uh, I mean, the dollars are real in terms of the difference that it would make for the residential taxpayers versus the commercial. So I do think uh, it's an important pursuit to increase the commercial value uh, and that's the best way of, uh, of changing that, that burden. Uh, but it is worth noting that in this current proposal, whether it's 1.73 or 7.2 or 7.1 in that area, uh, it's important that the residents understand uh, that this council has made a conscious decision to shift that burden and to provide significant relief to the residential taxpayers. Okay, so it, so it's hard to define precisely how much of a value, how much of an increase in value you'd need to, to make any kind of a... It is. We could certainly conduct that sort of analysis for you. I mean, it would be detailed and, and look at, uh, you know, all of the parcels we have and the aggregate value uh, and how much that, that shift would make a difference. I mean, that's, that's sort of an academic exercise. It would be instructed, and we're happy to do it. But I, I think for tonight's purposes, uh, it's important to, to note that it's really a collection of all of those dynamics, including increasing the value of the commercial property, and for now, shifting that burden uh, so that the residents get a break. And my last comment, and Mr. O'Donnell knows this well because he gave me a spreadsheet a couple of years ago. The other thing that, that hurts us <coughs> colleagues is that some of our largest employers pay absolutely no taxes whatsoever. The first one that comes to mind is the Brockton Hospital. The second one is the VA Hospital. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I could find two or three others. Uh, not to pick in the YMCA, but I don't believe they pay taxes on their property. So we provide all the services, police, fire, and everything else, and yet the homeowners and our commercial and industrial taxpayers subsidize that and it, it, it really is a shame that this isn't addressed by the legislature where some type of a pilot payment in lieu of taxes is made by these very large nonprofits some of whom I might add their CEOs make three hundred thousand dollars a year not bad or more that's right six hundred thousand dollars if you add everything in so we can't settle that tonight but for my part, I, I think we, we're going to have to leave the rate where it is at 173. I won't offer that motion yet because other people may wish to speak. Thank you, Councilor Fowell. Any other councilors? No councilors? I'm going to entertain a motion, though. What's the will of the council? Councilor Cruz, then follow up. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so follow up, and then I'm going to make a motion, which <coughs> my guess is it won't go far, but I'll look to make it anyways. Is uh, uh, and follow up and. I understand Council Fowell's frustration, the pilot programs that we we would like to see happen. Uh, unfortunately, that's a national and state problem that we we don't have the ability to address. But by by moving even that one percentage point, if we can help make the commercial property attractive against our, our competition, our competition is Easton and Avon and West Bridgewater. When we can make that more attractive. It brings in more business when those businesses, because keep in mind this is not just property tax, this is personal property tax. If we have a business that comes in, the machinery they have in their buildings, we tax. So it becomes, it's a win-win for the homeowners. We certainly can't jump in large percentage points to do this, but I am going to make a motion that we go to 1.72 for the tax factor. Thanks. Motion on the floor. Is, is there something on the motion? Anybody see on the motion? No. It was, uh, there was a motion on the floor. It was properly seconded. Uh, the fact of, contemplating the fact of 1.72. Take, take a roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Kindly read the roll. ASAP? No. Paul Regard? Yes. 
Blues? Yes. Ian Erie? Yes. Farwell? No. Lally? Yes. McGarry? Yes. Monaghan? Yes. DeCastro? Yes. Sullivan? No. Seven in the affirmative and three in opposition. It, uh, it's ordained. Yeah, it's, or, it's ordained. <coughs> is there a motion for reconsideration, Council? Make a motion for reconsideration. Hope there's not. Can I do final order number? Yeah, we'll take a we'll take a two minute recess. Take a recess. Well, now Back in, councilors. Okay. So Mr. Clark, in City Council, December second, twenty nineteen, order. The City Council hereby determines the percentages of the local tax levies in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 56, to be borne by each class of real property as defined in Section 2A of Chapter 59 and personal property. Residential, 71.5049. Commercial, 19.7040. Industrial, 3.5. 4766. Personal property, 5.3145. The factor for such classification shall be 1.72. <coughs> Councils, we need to take a roll call vote relative to what the clerk just read. Madam Clerk, kindly read the roll. ASAC? Yes. Beauregard? Yes. Cruz? Yes. Ian Yes. Farwell? No. Lally? Yes. Monaghan? Yes. The Castro? Yes. Sullivan? No. That's eight in the affirmative, two in opposition. It's Mr. here President, by, the order is here by ordained. Mr. President, make a motion for reconsideration that hopes does not prevail. Okay. This motion made uh, for reconsideration, hopes it doesn't prevail, is properly second. If you want to reconsider, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion for reconsideration does not prevail. Anything else before us tonight, Councils? Motion to Special meeting, a motion to adjourn. Mr. Cruz, is there a second on that? Mr. McGarry, uh, we're, we're adjourned, and if you're leaving tonight, drive careful. We'll take two minute recess before we go into finance. I hereby call the finance committee meeting for Monday, December 2nd, at being 7 p.m. Again, the reason why we're down here in the basement is the elevator is not operational at this time, uh, but I do want to thank everybody that worked to, uh, to get this meeting up and running. Councils, we have a pretty uh, good agenda tonight, and I am going to respectfully ask under the procedures, uh, this will be kind of a, um, a rare uh, request, but number 11 is resolved. Typically we take resolves last, but I have been asked uh, if we wouldn't mind as a collective council to take it. Make a motion to take 11 out of order. Second. Thank you. Mr. Palmer is traveling from Plymouth, Massachusetts tonight and due to the weather. So there is a motion on the floor. It was properly seconded. Take number 11 out of order. All in favor? I'll oppose that motion carries. We could please read number 11. Resolve to invite the chair of the Brockton Retirement Board, William Farmer, to inform the City Council on any updates and any changes retirees should expect and any new policies implemented. Invited William Farmer, Chairman, Brockton Retirement Board. Mr. Farmer, good evening. Good evening. How are you? Very good. Thanks for traveling up tonight. No problem. Thank you for taking me out of order. I just want to point out Gene Martineau, who's our executive director, is here as well, so if you have any questions, we can go ahead and do that. The Retirement Board is the agency that every time I come before the City Council, going back to the early 90s, the City Council would always say, you're the people who send us a bill and we can't do anything about it. And that's basically what it is. We tell you what the figure is, you have to pay it. We've sat down with mayors, we've sat down with Jay Condon, um, and we come to an agreement as to what the figure is. But once it comes out, it has to be paid statutorily. So there's very little we can do about it. A little bit about the board. There are five members, two elected by the members, and two appointed by, one is the city auditor, Mel, she's on the board, and the mayor appointed Jay Condon, so Jay Condon's on our board as well. And I'm the current chairman, and I've been on the board since the early 90s. Many, many chances to be replaced. Unfortunately, nobody seems to want to take my job, so <laughs> it's not bad. I get to come over here for basically no money and, and talk to you people about a retirement system. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about it, so I'm just gonna tell you just a little bit about the retirement system. We're currently 62% funded. Um, we expect to be fully funded in 2032. Um, the legislation said we had to be funded in 2028. 
but in the 2008 investment performance, the legislature changed it to 2040. So we're still well ahead of the 2040 when it's mandatory that everybody be funded. So we're at 2032. Our actual rate, actuarial rate of return is 7.75. That's the good news. The bad news is we're probably going to have to make it lower. So when we make our actuarial rate of return lower, that means cost goes up. All right. We, we may be mandated to go down to seven and a half, but right now we're at 7.75. Uh, as of September 13, 2019, our rate of return for 19 is 10.32 percent. So we're well ahead of our rate for this current year, and it's been a pretty good year since September 30th. So we're probably water, better than that, but that's all I have for actual figures. A um, couple of issues. Um, the other thing that this city has never done is raise the COLA base for retirees. Retirees get a 3% cost of living, but only on $12,000. So their current cost of living is $360 a year or $30 a month. Now, if you think of a retiree getting $12,000 a year, and you may think, well, how many of those can be? Somebody retired 20 years ago. The salaries weren't what they were. Um, you know, you know what it is. And there are a lot of people, we have a lot of retirees. I think our average pension, as much as what you read in the paper, is somewhere around $20,000. So we're not paying huge pensions to um, retirees. There's always some high ones, and there's always some low ones. So we'll be coming before you next year, once we get our actuarial uh, return done for 1120, hopefully to ask you to raise the base for the COLA from 12000 you can go up to 18. I think that's probably a little bit of a pipe dream, but maybe start out at 13 and then talk about it on a year-to-year -year basis. So that's one of the issues that we'll be bringing up next year. A um, couple of other things that you, you may or may not want to hear. Um, you do pre-employment physicals for police and fire. We've kind of suggested that maybe you do it for more than just police and fire. And I don't mean to pick on public works, but when you hire somebody at Public Works who's had two back surgeries, and then you expect him to go out and lift 50 pounds as part of his job, and you shouldn't be surprised that he has a back injury. When he has a back injury, he's 72% for the rest of his life. We pay that. Not, not that I object to anybody getting a disability that they're entitled to, but maybe if we screened employees a little better in some departments, um, it might save some money in the long run. Even though it costs you money to do it, in the long run, if you keep two or three people who shouldn't really have the job they have out because you did pre-employment physical, you save a ton of money on the other end. Um, the other issue that we've kind of talked over the years is uh, maximum age for police and fire. Um, it's kind of a hot, hot button issue, but if you hire a 40-year-old firefighter, he has to retire when he's 65, or a 40-year-old police officer. It's a young man's job. Hiring an older person to be a police or a firefighter doesn't work out in the long run. But, I mean, that's a, your decision, not our decision. Just come to think things that we've, I've told to bring up. Um, we have a no, new website we've just put up for employees to come in. And one of the questions I was asked is, how do we get employees to find out about retirement benefits? Well, they can come to the office anytime they want. They can call anytime they want. They can make an appointment anytime they want. Uh, we do, we are willing to come out and talk to employees. If somebody puts a group together, we're willing to do that. I would venture to say if we held a uh, meeting someplace at 6.30 in the evening at some local hotel and said all employees of the city of Brockton can come and find about retirement, we wouldn't have a lot of people come in because it's 6.30 in the evening. If it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and it's in an office building or it's in the city council chambers, we, it would be filled. People want to find out about retirement, but they don't want to necessarily do it on their own time. Just to, we're willing to do it, but we're only willing to do it if people are willing to come. Mom, we're not when willing. was the last time you did that? Uh, Jeannie, when was the last time you were asked? We've done it for the school year. We'll do it for anybody who asks. But somebody has to, whether it be a union person, has to put it together. We don't have the staff to try and convince people to come. People want to come, we'll come. We're, we're more than willing to do that. So 
anytime you want to do that, we're more than happy to do that. And I know you have a long agenda, so I'd rather, you, if you have questions, you ask me questions instead of me just rambling on. Mr. Palmer, thank you. Council Board, got this year resolved? Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Palmer, for coming out. Okay, this was, so first of all, you said that people can make an appointment. Where do they go? They go to our office. It's, uh, I just know where it is. I don't know the address. <coughs> Uh, 1322 Belmont Street. Okay. Behind Sullivan Tire. And, um, okay, so a phone number there is? <laughs> I, I, I'm I not just, trying I to just, put you in the spot here. I just text. Okay. It's, it's on the website. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's what one of the reasons why I called you up, yeah. is a lot of these older retirees, they're not on the website and what have you. So I, I just, I had spoken to um, Jean earlier today and we talked about how we wanted something on Broughton Community Access maybe posted with the information and maybe something forwarded to the Council on Aging so it can end up in their newsletters or maybe up on a poster board. Yeah, we, we'll, do, yeah. we'll, we'll do whatever you want. Okay, um, and I wanted people to understand that they could have these, these um, they could call, talk to you, find out about the benefits, I was concerned to, you know, certain updates, and then with various tax laws that change, does that affect certain people's retirement, et cetera, and that was... As far as taxes, the pensions are not subject to state tax in Massachusetts. And as far as federal tax, it, just like everybody else is going to tell you, this, we don't give federal tax advice, go see a tax advisor. Oh, no, that, that, well, I didn't expect advice. I just simply said this new law, it, let's say, you know, this arises, this new law is you are responsible for, and should you not, you know, then you will be penalized or something. And that's why I just want to make sure that people are aware of anything that could be detrimental well, to we, their... We, if, yeah. if there's something happening that's going to affect retirees, we notify them. How? And, by mail? By mail. If there's something that needs to do, every, and every other year... We're required to notify every retiree and make sure they're still alive. So we send them out a, uh, a form for them to have it notarized and sent back or bring it back to the office. And in that, we send out anything that they need to know, we tell them. Okay. We've asked for email addresses, not because we want to contact them all the time, but it's just easier nowadays to do it by email. Certainly. But if we have to, we do it all by, uh, by mail as well. All right, thank you. And like I said, I didn't want I don't want to hold you up because I know um, it's it's getting worse out there. And the other the other situation was certainly to let people know if there were any changes, how they could find out about you, uh, updates. And there was another thing too: should um, the retiree, let's say, go into a nursing home or not have their full, I would say, fa faculties? Is there a p procedure that people go through, their family well, member if, or something if, like that? If they have their faculties, they can set up a power of attorney. If thank they you. don't have their faculties, then it has to be done with through a legal guardian. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you again very much for coming okay. out here. Appreciate it. This is the type of information we constantly want flowing to individuals because, un you know, unfortunately, illness, et cetera, arises, and uh, some of our retirees are certainly much older and, again, not webs, you know, not uh, technologically savvy, and all this information is vital to them. So thank you very and, much for coming I, out I this I can evening. also tell you, when we have the COLA base, I know yes. some of the councils in the past, Anytime something affecting retirees is coming before the council, it's usually pretty crowded because they, they tend to find out. Good. So it's usually Good. pretty okay. crowded. There's usually some retirees in the audience. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, some follow up, please. Just to add a little humor to this, uh, I'd like to tell my colleague from Ward 5, some of us older retirees are fully functioning and we, we watch mm -hmm. those paychecks pretty carefully. <laughs> yes. We know the deductions that are coming out. And I will say the retirement board is very, very, very good at keeping us informed of what's going on, going on along with uh, this estate uh, retirees association you can belong to. So, uh, but we, and we actually use the internet too. No, I, I realize you do too, sir. Thank you. But the, you do, that's I have, I have run into constituents that's a little bit older and a little bit more concerned and have, you know, we're, it were challenged with it, so that, that's, that's any, why anybody I did this. Who, anybody okay. who calls us or anybody who needs any help, you let us know and we'll take care of it. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Yeah. Follow, Mr. Follow, in March, I'm going to ask you guys to come here during lunch and go in the GAR room. That's fine. Okay. Very great. good. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right. Thank Motion you. Motion recommend night. favorable. Second. Second. Right. Motion made, properly second. Favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Drive careful, Mr. Farmer. We'll go right on to agenda item number one, please. Order that the Brockton City <coughs> Council, acting on behalf of the City of Brockton, does hereby grant a perpetual right and easement to Massachusetts Electric Company for consideration of $1 to construct, 
reconstruct, repair, replace, add to, maintain, and operate for the transmission of high and low voltage electric current and for the transmission of intelligence an underground electric distribution system located in, through, under, over, across, and upon a parcel of land situated on the northerly side of Lincoln Street and southerly side of Church Street, being designated as Lot 51 on the City of Brockton's Tax Assessor's Plot 110. Invited Tory Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Rowley, Commissioner DPW. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that we take one and two collectively. Second, motion on the floor, take nine no numbers one and two collectively. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. If we could read number two, please. Ordered that the Brockton City Council, acting on behalf of the City of Brockton for consideration of one dollar, hereby grants to Massachusetts Electric Company the perpetual right and easement to install, construct, reconstruct, repair, replace, add to, maintain, and operate for the transmission of high and low voltage electric current and for the transmission of intelligence, an underground electric distribution system located upon a parcel of land situated on the westerly side of Warren Avenue, Brockton, Massachusetts, and further, that the City Council authorizes the Mayor to execute the grant of easement and to take other actions as necessary to carry out the terms, purposes, and conditions of the same. Invited Tory Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Rowley, Commissioner of DPW. Mr. Commissioner, good evening. Um, is, is anyone from National Grid here? by myself here. Um, what I was being told today, I called on this because I didn't know what was going on either, is the, uh, it's, it's the um, underground around downtown with the exploding manholes. This is another phase of their work. They want to take the transformers from underground and put them above ground. So that's why they need this land. So I have no objections to this, I what they're going to do. Contain a motion, Council. Motion for a favor recommendation. Second. Motion on the floor is properly on the, second. On the motion? On the motion, Mr. Mr. Clarkson, what are we going to do with this two dollars? <laughs> General fund. Thank you. <laughs> Motion made, properly second, favorable, back to the full council. If you're in favor, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Our motion carries. One and two, favorable, back to the full council. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Number three, please. Ordered acceptance and expenditure in the amount of $270,000 from U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Office for Victims of Crime, Fiscal Year 2019, Law Enforcement Based Victim Specialist Program Grant to City of Brockton Police Department, Fiscal Year 2019, Law Enforcement Based Victim Specialist Program Grant Fund. Invited, Tory Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Steve Williamson, Acting Chief of Police. Chief, good evening. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> item number three, this is a three-year, $270,000 grant. It's the paper salary fringe and overtime for a civilian vit, vit, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, victim advocate to be based out of the police department who will work with victims of violent crimes to match them with resources, walk them through the criminal justice system. The funds will also be used to purchase some office equipment and uh, some funds will be given to family and community resources incorporated to provide services to domestic violence victims. Thank you. Any questions? Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, Chief. The, um, is the victim ac advocate for the police department already, is it a position that's already there? Is, oh, is it no, a new, this is a new position. New position that will be available for three years, funded yes. for three years? If it was approved, it would, approved. she would work with the uh, grant coordinator. Okay, thank you. He or she. Move favorable. Second. On the motion. on the motion. Just a quick question. Now, is this, do you envision this person spending most of their time out on the field with the uh, officers, or how would this advocate work, do you think? Uh, I, I, I'm not really sure how much time they would be in the office, out of the office. Um, it's a new position. It's, I'm it's not really too long. familiar with everything they're going to be doing. Um, I'm sure they'll be out with, with victims. I don't know if we meet them at the police station or other places. So not in the courts. The courts have their own victim advocates. The courts have their own victim advocates. There might be some cooperation there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the motion, uh, Mr. Claxton, is there any, any match whatsoever? So in essence, this would be about a $90,000 a year salary over the three years. I think I want to go see that. Because you can 
based on my understanding of it, it'll be a little less than that because it does cover other uh, cover other other benefits. Right. Uh, but according to the application, there is no match required Excellent. by the city. Okay. Thank you, uh, Council Nicastro, Please. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, Chief Williamson. I just wanted to note um, in the packet that we received that the funds for this come from the Crime Victims Fund not from tax dollars, but from fines, penalty assessments, and bond forfeitures of convicted federal crime offenders. I think that's a great way to use the money to help people. And I, I hope that you're able to make good use of this person. I agree. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We the motion. There is a motion on the floor. It's properly seconded. Um, favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. That motion carries. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Favorable back to the full council. We'll go to number four, please. Ordered appropriation of the state legislative earmark in the amount of $50,000 from Department of Public Health Bureau of Substance Addiction Services Legislative Earmark Funding to Mayor's Office Legislative Earmark Funding Fund. Invited Tori Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Corin Capiello, Director of Social Services. Ms. Capiello, good evening. Good evening, Councillors. Uh, this is uh, $50,000 earmark funding. Uh, there's no match, and this will help the champion plan for about five to six months. Move, Move to rec recommend favorable. Second. Okay. Motion on the floor is favorable back to the full council. It was properly second. If you're in favor, raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. That motion carries. Favorable back to the full council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go on to number five, please. Ordered acceptance and expenditure of the donation in the form of two buses from Brockton Area Transit back to City of Brockton Fire Department. Total estimate value of $7,600. Invited for Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Williams, Chief of Fire. Chief, good evening. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Thank you all. <laughs> so this is two buses that the BAP of Brockton Area Transit is donating to my department for training purposes. Um, if you remember about a year and a half, two years ago, first student donated two buses to us and it was very instrumental in some bus training. Um, so BAP bus wanted to get on board, work Excellent. with us, and it's about the same project. It's all for training. Perfect. Motion for favor recommendation. Second. Motion made. It was properly seconded. It's a favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. That carries. Favorable back to the council. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. We'll go on to number six, please. Ordered acceptance and expenditure of additional sub-recipient grant award in the amount of $13,380.64 from Plymouth County District Attorney's Office, Fiscal Year 17, Violent Gang and Gun Crime Reduction Program, Project Safe Neighborhood Grant. Two, Brockton Police Department Fiscal Year 17 Violent Gang and Gun Crime Reduction Program, Pro Project Safe Neighborhood Grant Fund. Invited, Tori Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Stephen Williamson, Acting Chief of Police. <coughs> Chief, good evening. Good evening. Uh, this is part of the Project Safe Neighborhood Grant uh, involving the DA's office. Uh, this grant was supposed to end on September 30th, but it was extended through May 30th of next year. Uh, with that, they gave us an additional $13,380.64 in funds. Uh, we previously received $20,000. Uh, these funds paved to conduct uh, ride-alongs with uh, parole, adult probation, and juvenile probation. Uh, we also canvassed neighborhoods following shots fired, uh, investigations, and uh, for hot spots also. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Entertain a motion. Second. second. The motion made was properly second. It's favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, kindly raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. That motion carries. Favorable back to the full council. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Go on to number seven, please. Ordered that sum of $5,457,233 is appropriated to pay various capital costs as set forth, including the payment of all costs incidental and related thereto, to Cemetery Department, $650,000, <coughs> Fire Department, $1,260,000, Information technology, total 448,000. Water department, total 1,126,233. And parks and recreation, total $1,973,000. Invited, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Williams, Chief of Fire, William Santos, Acting Director of Information Technology, Lawrence Rowley, Commissioner of DPW, Timothy Carpenter, Superintendent of Parks. Good evening, Ms. Clarkson. Good evening, Mr. President and members of the council. What you have before you is our proposed uh, capital plan for this fiscal year. As you know, we are working on, as required by the ordinances, a six-year <coughs> plan, uh, and we hope within the next uh, month or so to introduce that six-year capital plan to you. But these items 
are what are proposed for capital investment for the city uh, for this fiscal year. I did provide you uh, with the assistance of uh, Karen Praval, our budget director, uh, an analysis of this year's capital items. Uh, many of those uh, in that spreadsheet and that those first two columns have been paid for through the operating funds in the 2020 budget or enterprise uh, revenues. But we wanted to highlight them there just so that you saw that we've already made a significant investment uh, in our capital needs through uh, regular revenues. What's before you uh, are other items that are proposed uh, to be purchased through borrowed funds. Uh, but what we've done is created a funding scenario where most of what we're asking you to spend tonight will be paid for with funds other than general funds. And I think that's very significant and important, uh, not only for you to note as the uh, appropriating authority, but for the taxpayers to understand that of the little more than $5 million we're asking you to invest in the city's uh, infrastructure and capital needs tonight, just only a little more than 400000 will come from general fund revenues. Uh, and so we've worked really hard uh, to, to be consistent with the mandate of this council and of the mayor to be always mindful of the taxpayers when we're looking uh, to buy things and build things. And so, for instance, uh, when Tim Carpenter came to us and said that we needed a significant expansion of the Melrose Cemetery. We looked for ways that we could fund that without just spending cash or, or, or borrowing and then paying back with general funds. So working together, uh, we looked at the ordinance which created that fund. We looked at a three-year revenue snapshot. Uh, our bond council provided us with an analysis of what a payback schedule would look like, and we're able to recommend that we conduct that $650,000 cemetery expansion because we know that we can responsibly pay the principal and interest uh, within the funds that we get every year, not to mention uh, the funds that, that, that are set aside. Uh, the same goes with, uh, with the proposal to purchase two pumpers for the fire department. So. Uh, the mayor recently executed a contract extension with Brewster Ambulance that provides us uh, with $650,000 a year in revenue. This year, you decided uh, to appropriate about $370,000 of that towards the general fund for the operation uh, of the fire department. But obviously, that leaves significant <coughs> revenue on an annual basis that we can use uh, to pay the principal and interest for purchasing two pumpers. And so, uh, throughout this proposal, uh, we've identified funding sources for uh, most of what we propose you purchase. Uh, the only item or items that we propose be funded through general funds uh, are investment in our information technology, uh, which uh, when they were originally proposed, uh, the uh, mayor believed that that was an important investment. I I concur. Uh, Bill Santos is here, obviously, to answer any specific questions you might have. Uh, but we feel as though this is a very responsible uh, and fiscally conservative capital plan that makes some necessary investments, uh, but remains <coughs> mindful of the long-term costs. So with that, I'm happy to answer any uh, questions you have. And all of the affected department heads are also here to answer any specific questions you have uh, in terms of their purchases. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Uh, Councilor Fowler, followed by Ian Airy, please. Uh, Mr. Clarkson, the, as written on the agenda, it just says we're appropriating $5.457 million. This is actually, for the record, authorization for the mayor and the treasurer to borrow that amount, correct? Up to that amount. Up to right. that yeah. amount. And that specifically, right to the dollar, this is where the funding will be spent. In other words, if we vote affirmatively on this, favorably on this tonight and then affirmatively in council, these specific amounts will be allocated as shown here in item number six, correct? Yes. Okay. And with the exception of, uh, you said IT, uh, they're included in your capital plan, but they're not included in the borrowing. That will come from uh, unappropriated local receipts? No, they're included in the borrowing. Uh, what I 
said was that will be supported by general funds. And so the principal and interest for the IT portion will be paid out of the regular operating budget. I mean, not to get too much in the weeds for you, they'll all be paid out of the operating budget, right? Uh, but there will be transfers made in to cover that amount. So you'll see in the 2021 budget request a transfer in from the cemetery fund for an amount commensurate with whatever the amount of the principal and interest will be. It'll actually be in the 2022 budget, but you understand okay. it. it, and it so it's a, and it's unless, a, unless I've missed it, do we know what the debt service on this will be? Because we've, we've had some repetitive borrowings, and, and I always like to find out where we are with what our debt service payments are going to be for FY21 and, and going forward. And I, unless I've missed it, counselors, I don't see the repayment. Uh, uh, I do have here, uh, and I'd be happy to make copies for you. That's fine. The actual, the debt service schedules individually provided to us uh, by bond council for each and every one of those purchases. What, okay, what, what is it, if you know, what is it collectively per year? What's, what's the debt service on this 5.4 million going to be? And over what period of time? So it, that varies, mm -hmm. uh, okay. and that, that's why it's broken up, because for some of them, uh, it's, it's only a five-year borrowing, say for the $30,000 tractor. That's five years, because it, it relates to the useful They're all life different. of what okay. we're borrowing. All right. But I'm happy, Councillor, to give this to you so you can look at it, uh, because it, it breaks it out by each individual borrowing and shows you what that will cost. Thank you. So, Thank you. you know what I'll do? I'll, uh, I'll scan it, and I'll email it so you'll That's all have fine. it. Thank you, Mr. Clarkson. Okay. Uh, Councilor Yanier, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Clarkson, obviously, you're going to bring up the Shady You want to make it? Yes, we also provided you uh, with the individual requests from each department so that you could, uh, you could hear the, the requests in their voices. Let me, um, let me just ask you one, because I've always been a stickler on it since I've been here for the 16 years. And why can't we buy more than just, it says here, four plus police cruisers, which replaces two that were totaled. So when we get the two, the four new ones, we'll get two more totaled, and we'll still be, why can't we get more? Well, we certainly can, and, and those, uh, in, in that instance, uh, let's see, on police, so those were funded in the operating budget, okay. uh, and certainly if the council wishes to, to purchase more than four cruisers, then uh, we can request more in the operating budget. You did, in, uh, if you recall, at a previous meeting, uh, include a mid-year appropriation for an additional 150000 to purchase uh, a, a couple of additional cruisers for the, uh, for the traffic division. We have, excuse me, the mayor's giving me signed sign signal, so. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, good evening. More. So we have, we have some others coming in just what's here, Mr. Mayor, because, I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you could put 10 on, and that's not really enough, to be truthful with you, because we know sooner put new ones on, and there's always a situation, and depending upon, you know, who hits who, you know, it's what we get back. You know that, you know how that works, so. But, I, I mean, okay, knowing that we still have some others coming in, it makes me feel a little bit more happy, but I would like it if we could ever, at some point, still increase to. Sure. That, I just, I look at that as a big public safety factor, as well as the fire department, but they, you know what I mean? They're on the road every single, every single moment, too, so run time's important. But thank you, Mr. Clark. You thank, thank you, thank Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Council Cruz, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm a little confused on a couple of things here. First of all, I don't see in this order police cruisers. Where, where is that in this it, order? Council, they're not in there. Uh, so what we provided was a spreadsheet that has all of the capital items. And so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the police cruisers and all of those items in those first two oh, columns okay. were already approved by but that's you not part of what we're talking about right now. Correct. Okay. So all we're talking about what was in uh, the, this, the order, this order. The order in front of us right now is what we're talking about. Cemetery department, fire department, IT, DPW, water, and parks and recreation. And I'm just a little confused. In the past, we, we as a council will have to vote on an authorization to bond. Is that what you are saying this is? So this... Because I don't read this as an authorization of bond. It's on, it's on the enclosure. Uh, well, I see that, but you're saying that some of this... You're saying some of this will be bonded and some won't be. 
No, it, it will all be bonded. What I was saying was that some will be paid with general funds, the rest will still be bonded, but the principal and interest will be paid with funds other than general funds, so that it, uh, they will okay. not have a direct impact on our budget and therefore the taxpayer. Okay. So this, the, this order was prepared in concert with Lock Lord, our bond council. Okay. There's one other sentence in here that I've never seen in an authorization we've done before. Maybe it's there. You can correct me. The amount set forth for each individual product, project are necessarily estimates. And the mayor is authorized to expend more than the amount set forth above for any particular project and less for others, so long as in the judgment of the mayor each of such capital projects can be undertaken and completed within the total amount appropriated by this order. The way I read that, uh, is that the mayor can take this amount and he could do anything he wants with it of these items. I've never seen that in our, in our approvals before. So I can tell you that the language was specifically prepared by Lock Lord, by our, our bond council. Obviously, uh, I, I can't speak to what the, the council has approved before, but I, I can assure you that uh, at least from my perspective, the spirit of the vote is as important uh, as the, the, the legal language. Look, the courts don't look at the spirit of the vote. The courts look at the vote. Well, understood, but I, I, I'm accountable the way I read this to, in, to you and to I, the city. The, the current mayor and a future mayor will be there shortly, I trust completely, but the way I look at this, a mayor could, uh, there's a precedent set where a mayor could say, all right, I just want to do this water department work. I now have this total amount to do it and I can, I can decide not to. Can you point to me, Council, where that specific so language is? So in the large paragraph that starts in, to meet this appropriation, the treasurer, with the, with the approval of the mayor, is authorized to borrow set amount. Eight lines, seven. Through the chair. Sorry? Through the chair to the... To, uh, Thank you, Mr. McGarry. Eight lines, seven. So under the million, 973 number. If you go eight lines down. Got it. The amount set forth for each individual group project are necessarily, and I'm not questioning our current mayor or our soon-to-be mayor, but the precedent that, and again, I just don't believe we've ever voted for it that way. That, to me, is, is all we're saying is we're approving the dollar amount, and the mayor can then see it, do as he sees fit, which for future mayors, uh, I, I may not always have a mayor that I trust and a mayor to be elected I trust so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Get an extra Christmas present. <laughs> so what I what I would say is again, this language was prescribed not uh, by anyone other than bond council, and this language, if if I'm reading it, I have it on page five, that exact language of the 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 letter prepared by bond council. Uh, if you'll note, that's in relation specifically to the 1.973. Are we on the same page here? Yes. Yeah. And so what I believe that language is saying uh, is that within the parks and recreation portion of this capital investment for $1,973,000, for instance, if the turf sweeper comes in at $36,000 rather than $35,000, so long as the total appropriation for the parks and recreation portion of this, and those funds will be paid from that budget, uh, as long as the total, the aggregate amount of the capital spending doesn't exceed 1.973, uh, that the mayor has some discretion uh, for those amounts. But I, I, I would not agree that the language states uh, that the mayor has the discretion, for instance, to buy a motor scooter uh, because the vote no, of the I didn't say that. I didn't say that. The way I read this, is the mayor could choose to, if the Melrose Cemetery land expansion came in at $900,000, he could move the 250 there and decide to skip another portion, or he could totally build the turf, multi-purpose, the turf field, say that came in at 2.4 million. That it, in other words, it's, the way I read this, it gives the latitude to take that dollar amount within these items that we're approving. So I, have, I, I would and move offer. It around yeah, I, I, I would suggest that that's not the case, that what you're voting is the approval of these specific items. What the language says, uh, let me read it. 
in its entirety, the amounts set forth for each individual item are necessarily estimates, and the mayor is authorized to expend more than the amount set forth for any particular project and less for others, so long as in the judgment of the mayor, each of such capital projects can be undertaken and completed within the total amount appropriated by this order. So the way I read that, and I believe the, the, the way it was prepared by bond council, is to enable you to vote this in the aggregate within parks and recreation so that you didn't have to do a separate order for each of these items. But I believe that language recognizes that you are indeed and in fact uh, approving the purchase of each of those items but granting the mayor some flexibility in terms of the cost of each of those items. But I don't believe that this language provides him the discretion to then decide uh, to do some and not do others. It is, by the way, as with any borrowing, an authorization, right? And then the actual borrowing comes at a later time. So a decision could be made not to borrow the money at all uh, if, if the conditions warranted uh, I mean, there's never a requirement to borrow when this body authorizes a borrowing. So right, you would still have to come back to us for the approval for the bond? The, the, in, in this form of government, I believe when the, the money is actually uh, borrowed, do you typically sign those notes? No. So, no. So that usually it's done by <coughs> the executive and the, and the clerk. Uh, and the treasurer, in my experience. And, and so I'm guessing that when we borrow money here, it's signed by the mayor and by the clerk's office and by the treasurer. So uh, there would not be a, a, a revisit back here, unless there was a decision uh, to, to invest in other things. And then, so again, I, this does not provide the mayor the discretion uh, to, to purchase things other than specifically what's listed here. Has our uh, city solicitor looked at this that's a good question I don't I don't know the answer to that uh, it, it, because Just, it was provided it was lock Lord is the the bond council that the the city has had yeah. for a very long time and they've prepared uh, the uh, that I mean, they went under different names but they're a, they're a, right I'm aware of them I just I'm a little uncomfortable with that I want to look back I'm not gonna hold this up tonight but I may want to hold it up Monday night I'm gonna ask the city solicitor to give us a that uh, Again, that sentence to me, first of all, I don't believe it does just apply to the park and recreation number. It's the way that, I mean, talks about the, the water tr clean water trust in that par paragraph, talks about other things. It's, uh, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with that line, with the discretion that it leaves in that line. So I'm, I won't do anything tonight, but uh, before we vote on it next, next Monday night, I'm going to want further fair clarification. So Thank you, Council. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I do have one other question Council on Cruise, the please. actual project <coughs> for Mr. Carpenter. Um, you left us a map tonight for my map of the cemetery. So where are we looking to expand and do we own the property already and you have to do work or can you give me a little explanation? map that I provided to you, if you see the area that's lightly highlighted in red, uh, it's an existing area within the cemetery, within yep. the Melrose Cemetery currently, that is undeveloped. Um, it, now, approximately three years ago, uh, the then Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Condon, um, decided not to uh, renew the revolving fund that we used to have for the sale, or I'm sorry, for uh, <coughs> the sale of vaults. Yeah. Um, and that money was transferred into what was then the gasoline line item. So there were some questions at the budget why I had $167,000 in my gasoline line item. Uh, so we've utilized those funds to do engineering on three different areas within the cemetery. Uh, so currently the engineering's done. We could go out to bid as soon as this uh, fund hopefully gets a favorable vote. Uh, so this area is within the cemetery. Um, it is actually a very highly cost-effective area to develop um, because it's it's actually three to four feet lower than the area well, around that's it. That's my question. Um, do you see any issue? We've had drainage issues with the back going into the back. Uh, what street is that? It's Rangeley uh, Avenue. What's that? Rangeley yeah, Avenue. Yeah, Rangeley. So, and we have alleviated those problems right now. <coughs> How will we do this and not? 
cause runoff problems? So the intention here is to um, pitch this particular section from north to south so that the, the water, if there is any runoff, again, it's a very large area, um, so that if there is any runoff, it runs northerly and southerly and not directly towards the west. So that southerly distance is enough to filter that water, you think? Correct. Yes. And in the fact that there's you know, an existing um, area between where we would like to expand the cemetery and the end of the cemetery, there's another section there, that provides a whole other biofilter to capture any of that water that may run that way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I have a question for the uh, fire chief, if I could. Chief. Good evening. How are you, chief? So during the budget, I know we, uh, we, were, we were really thrilled to hear that you're going to buy two new trucks, and then you guys hit the home run on that third with a grant. Absolutely. Can you just give us a status update on that? Sure. So the grant um, is going to be okayed, hopefully, by you next Monday night. Excellent. And we kind of need to really get this rolling because we want to try and get the contract signed for these three pieces of it's apparatus. It's all time sensitive, right? Correct. Okay. For the pricing. Um, also the bill time, things like that. Okay. But to get the prices locked in, um, we want to try and get it done before the end of the year. We will. There will we'll be a savings. Done. Okay. Thank you. You're Any welcome. questions for the chief? Councilman Castro, please. Oh, yeah. Thank you, chief. You're welcome. Thank you, chief. You're welcome. Mr. Santos, you. good evening. There are several items here that information technology will benefit from. I'm interested to know about GIS for $240,000. Right. Did you get the handout? I, I did, but I got it at 4.31 this afternoon, okay. and I, I, I breezed it. I gave a hard it. copy as well. Pardon? I, I sent a hard copy as well to everyone. Did um, you not receive it? Uh, I, I have one. I printed oh, okay. it. Thank you. Okay, so, so Thank you. Your question? My question is, what is? Can you just give us an overview? So of sure. Uh, basically, it's um, services for both departments and the community. Uh, it's a map-based system, and uh, you know you can do anything. Well, right now you can do like an abutters list, which benefits the community, and then you can come in and certify it. Um, things for the fire department might be to um, identify all condos in a, in a complex so when they're driving in they know what building it's in, what floor it's on. Uh, at a hospital it, it might indicate where they hold the oxygen, things of that nature. Uh, there, there's a pretty extensive list here, a little bit for everybody. There's an awful lot for um, uh, DPW. Um, cleaning up what they call tie cards, the little cards that just tell you that on a particular street there's a six inch pipe in the ground, um, might be a hundred years old and it's all on a little index card. These would be laid out on maps and identified in size and color. Um, it, it would just, uh, it would benefit the DPW in, in, in you know, times where the thaw comes and and they know that they have a hundred year old pipe in that area and it could burst in the spring and uh, so, some benefits to uh, like the planning and zoning would be to um, create zoning maps that the public and developers could look at prior to coming in. Uh, we could take the maps and, and uh, have them available right at the planning board on, on tablets so that they could have their discussions about a piece of property. So you will contract this work out? Yes, most of it, yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll set up interviews with, and we already have done a lot of the interviews with departments, but this uh, company called Tie and Bond, uh, they've already done an awful lot of work in the assessor's office, and um, they would come in and, and do the interview based on what we've already gathered, and then get actual information from the department, not just from me, and then uh, put it, lay it out on a map and design it. And uh, John from the assessor's office has already done an awful lot of work in getting all of our maps squared away and um, the sh form shapes are, are uh, I guess there's a, there's a standard, it's called a level three, MassGIS level three data standard. 
So they've, they've taken our maps, our parcel data, and corrected any misshaping so that it's, it's pretty, uh, I think it's within a meter on, on large lots. So it's, it's very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Council. Any other questions? Council Isaac, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not so much a question, but um, I would just like to give my colleagues some information. Um, as one of the councilors that serves on the IT board with, uh, with Mr. Santos, we wanted to um, actually, we, when we saw this coming up on the agenda, Mr. Santos had offered to have Ty and Bond come before us, but because of a uh, which is the company who services the uh, GIS uh, system. And because of the time issue and the holiday, and um, they're, I think, out in the western part of the state, they weren't able to be at our uh, finance meeting. And even Ms. Santos could have showed us a little bit on the screens, but um, upstairs, but due to the issue with the elevator, it's become a little bit difficult. But this is a very impressive program. I know that the city has wanted to purchase this for uh, numerous years and implement it, but um, it's something that's being, being used in uh, multi-municip and municipalities all over Massachusetts. It's very impressive, and I asked my colleagues, I'm sure if you reach out to the IT um, department, they will give you a little um, you know, demonstration. Maybe once we're back up in chambers, we can have Mr. Santos before us to show us a little bit how it works. But it could be used um, by it multiple departments, as he stated, as well as uh, residents can view it on our website. And it, it's very detailed. It gives you information on parcels. can even tell you where fire hydrants are. And um, I mean, just it's an all over impressive program and it's um, long overdue. I think uh, many municipalities in Massachusetts already use it. So just, uh, just want to give you a little bit of background information. We did try to coordinate to have Ty and Bond here, but it just wasn't going to work out with the, um, with the holiday and the time, um, time yeah. issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Councilor. Councilor Board, God, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Santos. And um, I just, it's so everybody realizes here, we have four pages worth of information that we're going to have to whole software would do yeah. and um, one part here they they let people know oh the school system the people can look up their bus routes for their kids that's correct um, veterans and senior services um, over here they have something with the uh, mayor's office where people would know which ward they would look up and find out where they could go where they vote where um, the uh, their city councilor is um, all, all sorts of things here train inventory um gypsy moth tracking mosquito treatment, etc. And I want to point out at the end here, there's something about drone services. So we'll get our drone yet for this city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Motion favor really recommendation. Second. Second. Motion made. Motion. Oh. motion. Just could we have a request, please, to uh, have the solicitor yep. take a look at that? Yep. And give a precedent from Council Cruz on the motion to get uh, an opinion from the solicitor's office relative to the verbiage that's in the Thank language. you. Uh, motion made, properly seconded, favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Our motion carries favorable, and we will get that from the solicitor's office. <coughs> Thank you. Go on to number E, please. Ordered acceptance and expenditure in the amount of 68000 from <coughs> Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, Mass DEP, Sustainable Materials Recovery Program Grant to Department of Public Works Refuse Division, Sustainable Materials Recovery Program Grant Fund. Invited Tori Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Rowley, Commissioner of DPW, Patrick Sullivan, Refuse Contract Administrator. Commissioner, good evening. Good evening, Councilors. Councilors, this is a uh, no match grant for 68000 We're going to use this money to pay off our uh, new barrels. Motion to recommend favorably. Yeah, I'm sorry, what, please? Our new barrels that we just oh, received. Okay. The trash, I'm sorry, trash barrels. Okay. Okay. Motion made, probably second favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, raise your hand. You're pulling raise your hand. That fair. You're favorable back to the council. Mr. Sullivan's here too. Thank you for being here, Mr. Thank Sullivan. You. Number nine, please. Ordered acceptance and expenditure in the amount of five thousand from Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, <laughs> Mass DEP, Massachusetts Electric Vehicle Incentive Program, Mass E VIP. Grant to Department of Public Works, Massachusetts Electric Vehicle Incentive Program, Mass E VIP Grant Fund. Invited Tori Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Lawrence Rowley, Commissioner of DPW, Patrick Sullivan, Refuse Contract Administrator. 
Commissioner. So, good evening, Councilors. So, Councilors, we um, applied for this and we got it. Um, so, we're going to use this $5,000 towards a new electric car. Um, I believe the, uh, for a, to lease a new electric car. For the three years uh, term on a new electric car is about $9,000. So, who, whatever department gets it is going to have to pay the other four Sorry. for it. Motion recommend favor. Second. Motion made properly. Second favorable back to the full council. If you're in favor, raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. That carries. Favorable back to the full council. Last agenda item for the night. Com number 10. Council President, can can I just give a quick update on the storm? Of course you can. I'm sure Absolutely. everybody would Please like do. to know. So we're expecting probably four to eight inches. The worst part of the storm is going to be between 4 a.m. and 10 a.m. So we've canceled school. We've canceled trash. Trash will be on a holiday. Uh, Friday's trash will be picked up Saturday. City Hall is closed. I'm going to have about 150, maybe 160 pieces of equipment out. Um, so please stay off the roads. And when the parking ban goes into effect, or the snow emergency is going to go into effect at 10 p.m. tonight, we're going to be very aggressive. We're going to tow. I want these roads clean. So I just wanted to get that out to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Everybody be safe out there tonight. Number 10, please. Ordered that the City Council dedicate the following percentage which may not be less than 25% of the local option excise on retail marijuana sales revenues collected under MGL Chapter 64N, Section 3, to the Community Impact Stabilization Fund established under MGL Chapter 40, Section 5B, effective for fiscal year 2020, beginning July 1, 2019, or take any other action relative thereto. Invited for Clarkson Chief Financial Officer, Philip Nasrallah, City Solicitor. Good evening, Ms. Clarkson. Good evening. Uh, City Solicitor Nasrella, as he mentioned, could not be here tonight. Uh, this item you considered at a previous meeting, and the mayor, uh, who is here as well, had asked that it be refiled for your consideration because he wanted uh, to specifically list the, the percentages for this revenue. So I believe that's why it's uh, back on the agenda for your consideration. Uh, and I have those um, in the order that was filed uh, by the mayor. It it listed those uh, percentages, but I don't believe. Yeah, there you go. All right, so it's there. I, I just wanted to make sure because one of the copies I received, it, it, it was not on there. So you can see uh, up to 25 percent for. Hiring, retaining public safety personnel, up to 20% DPW and infrastructure, and, and it goes on. So I'm happy to answer any questions about that clarification, uh, but as I mentioned, the mayor is here as well, uh, and this was uh, uh, his initiative to make sure that, uh, that those percentages were part of your consideration in the creation of this st uh, stabilization fund. Thank you, Mr. Clarks. And Councils, I believe when... Uh when the lay file was filed, it was actually the original order. I just think it was an error. So the one that we have before us is the one that should have been filed and was properly submitted. Mr. Monahan. Any questions? Just point of information. Councilor Fowler, please. Mr. Claxton, should we also be creating a revolving account? No. So the, the monies will stay in this stabilization fund. And as we discussed, when it was before you in a different form, uh, then the money will be appropriated as with the regular stabilization fund, only with the authorization of the council. Okay, thank and you. And so what I presume will occur in future fiscal years uh, is that when the mayor puts together his budget, or her budget, uh, but certainly for the next two years, his budget, uh, he will determine whether or not he wishes to request that you use a portion of these monies uh, for these purposes as set forth here. So this doesn't require that, it just says up to, so the council will still have the final say in terms of the appropriation of monies from the stabilization fund. Thank you. Move for favor of the motion, Chair. On the motion then. Carlos, please. So the way this is written, it may not be less than 25%, but so what you're saying is 100% of the funds will go into the stabilization fund, but you will keep an earmark on what dollar amount is the uh, is in the stabilization fund and if the mayor doesn't choose to use these they just get used as as general revenue 
No, the money would then, uh, if it's not used for any of these purposes, it would stay in the stabilization fund. So that's why so I, the, so the, the law, if, if you remember, we provided you a copy of uh, the IGR from, uh, from the Commonwealth, and they have uh, been very particular about how marijuana monies can be used. And the money has to either, on an annual basis, just go in the general fund, and in that case, for any municipal use, is just general revenue, uh, or the creation of a stabilization fund. So we had talked well, about- not the creation of a stabilization fund. It's gonna go into our stabilization fund that we already have. No, you're creating a separate marijuana sales community stabilization. impact stabilization fund. That's correct. Through through your actions with with this order, the creating the community. So this is a stabilization fund only and specifically for the marijuana revenues. It acts like the so regular this, stabilization. This order fund. that we're looking at, you think it creates the community impact stabilization fund? So that question arose at, at your last meeting. And I, and I did follow up on it and have a conversation with Assistant Solicitor Bridges, who has been the primary point of contact on this. Uh, and I believe from my conversation with her uh, that, that that is the case. So this language is similar to an order that you considered before but tabled, but this one actually enumerates uh, at, at the request of the mayor uh, how those monies will be distributed. And if these, these dollar amounts would be special projects, in other words, up to 5% of total for senior citizen support in the COA, that would need to be in addition to what we, we do for the Council on Aging anyways. That's correct. So if there was an, a special initiative or the hiring of a part-time person for uh, Meals on Wheels, or whatever initiative the mayor had within his budget, he wanted to augment the funding in a particular department, then what this order says, that if we took in a million dollars of marijuana revenue in any given year, then 50,000, up to 50,000 of that uh, could be for citizen support in the Council on Aging. And all we have to use every year is at least 25 percent. Other than that, we can roll it over. Uh, you don't have to use any of it, so that's like with your stabilization fund now, the same laws apply. So you don't have to spend any of it. What you're saying here is uh, you are specifying should the money be spent, uh, you're being very clear about the intent uh, of both the executive and the legislative about how that money gets expended. But if you don't spend it because it's a stabilization fund, the money just stays in there and it doesn't roll over to, to, to anything else. It acts, it, it's created under the same law as the regular stabilization fund. There are communities that have, for instance, a capital stabilization but fund. But it's not a stabilization fund. Stabilization fund is basically there as a rainy day reserve. Well, but no, it is. It, it, it most certainly is a stabilization fund. It's just, uh, so to use well, another we example. we only use it for these items. That's exactly right. So some, a lot of communities have what's called a capital stabilization fund, and they put monies away for capital purposes so that you can keep the money there and it doesn't roll into free cash. And when you want to spend cash on a capital project rather than borrow, then the legislative body can appropriate out of a capital stabilization fund for a specific purpose. Uh, with the same limitations, by the way, it's more difficult to take money, as you know, out of a capital, uh, out of a stabilization fund than it is uh, say to transfer within the general fund, right? right? It's a higher threshold. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilman Casper, please. Thank you. Mr. Clark, good evening. I, I'm just looking at this order, okay? And, it, and on the second line it says, which may not be less than 25% of the local option excise on retail marijuana sales revenues, okay? So it says retail marijuana, but then down in the next paragraph, if you will. It says the following is yearly funded distribution generated from medical marijuana. Is that, is that right? Or shouldn't it be, instead of medical, shouldn't it say retail? Yes, I think you're right. That, that, that slipped by all of us. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> But 
No, but FY 2020 began on July 1, 2020. Oh, I think they mean 2020. FY 2020 began on <laughs> July 1. It should be 2021, shouldn't it? It is 2021, yeah. And so it, it should be 2021 beginning on July, July 1, 2020. 2020. Because the, the, the law, as, as we mentioned last time, uh, this will be for next fiscal year. So any monies taken in this fiscal year will will go into the general fund and become free cash. Okay. Councilor Castle, can you make those three uh, provisions in the form of a motion? Okay. I make a motion to amend this order um, so that on the fifth line, FY 2020 is changed to FY 2021. Beginning on, instead of July 1, 2020, I'm sorry, 2019, should be July 1, 2020. And then in the next line, it would be distribution generated from, instead of medical marijuana, it should say retail second. marijuana. Second. It's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion made, properly seconded, to amend it. Those three things stated as Councilman Castro. All in favor? All opposed? That carries. It's amended as such. <coughs> Anything else before us? We're going to vote on the, yeah, vote on the, yeah. on the order. You just said the amendment, right? Yeah. Motion to favor recommendation as amended. Yep. There's a second. Motion, there's a motion made, properly seconded. It's a favorable back to the full council as amended. All in favor? All opposed? That carries. As amended, back to the full council. Good pickup, Councilman Casper. Thank you. Mr. Anything Chairman. else before us? <clears throat> Councilman Ian Erie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I might, I just want to have a, um, just a couple of quick minutes. I know we do all want to get home before it gets uh, nastier than what it is out there, but um, something I want to um, bring to your attention that um, it caught my eye this past weekend. It really caught my eye a week or two ago when we were at the License Commission meeting when I was sitting there and saw that three or four different uh, organizations are uh, renting the um, Shaw's facility. Um, what really caught my eye was yesterday, naturally, when I, and I don't always look at everything on the uh, uh, computer or on the telephone, but I do, and when I saw that there was some difficulty at a function that was held uh, at the uh, Shaw Center on uh, um, this past, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this past Saturday evening, um, and when I saw that uh, it was a situation that occurred with uh, a couple of people and also occurred with a couple of our police officers, um, I started to begin to talk to myself and say, I don't ever recall us ever having a, a complete conversation to how and what we were going to do with the Shaw Center when the Shaw Center became our facility last year. We were going to um, study the issue, figure out what we were going to do. Um, the former late mayor um, had also been a part of that uh, discussion, and we were going to, as a group, as a council, um, decide what we were and how we were going to um, rent that facility. Now, all of a sudden, I'm finding out, as I'm sitting at the License Commission meeting, where some people are coming before the License Commission asking for, um, you know, a license for evening events, and the one that was held Saturday was uh, from 6 o'clock p.m. to 2 o'clock p.m., which I think was a long drink time. Um, I was there, and Councilor Nicastro was even there present uh, at that meeting, and um, we both asked a couple questions of these organizations, um, and then we're finding out that some, you know, one's paying $1,000, one's paying $1,500, somebody's paying $2,000. Who said that we were going to go into the rental business with this, with this facility? And um, that being said, I mean, it's bothered me, um, and, I, and I don't think it's being operated the correct way. Uh, you know, who, who is the, the manager of, the facilities manager? Who's, who's telling them what, how much each and everybody's going to pay? And, and how is the check getting collected? And, you know, all of a sudden we're in the business of this facility that we all took a tour through that felt that wasn't ready to be utilized yet, even the former late mayor and indicated that we would come together as a group. What, I'm, what I guess I'm getting at is we never came together as a group to have full discussion. I think it's late, too late now to do it with the legislative year coming to an end, and I am going to file for January that we have a resolve, and that I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor Elect, but it's going to be in your lap because we're going to have to decide. That's fine. On January 11th, we're having an inaugural party there. I took a tour of it today. <laughs> So I just want to let you know that. Okay. By all means, you can follow yeah. results. Now, what's your, what's your, I'm not being trying to be rude, what's your fee total? 
Pardon me? Who set your fee total? Nobody set a fee. I took a tour. I was told there was no heat. There is heat there. Rugs, I said, rugs are deplorable. It needs to be So cleaned. there's no fee for you? <coughs> I have no clue, Dennis. <laughs> Dennis. There we go. Dennis, why don't you talk to the mayor? Okay. We're going to move on now, Council. Thank you. Sorry, <coughs> but I will file a resolve in January. We'll have full discussion about it because it's not right if we're going to start to run a nightclub or whatever up there. It's within a neighborhood, and I'll have to start listening to the extra noise, and I don't think it's fair when we said we would all discuss it as a group to what we would do to how that facility would get handled. Talk about transparency, some councillors. Where are you on this one? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, councillor. Anything else before us tonight? Seeing that we're going to adjourn. Drive careful. It's slippery out there.